All right, uh, this is going to be our, our fourth and final lecture, uh, followed by uh, a brief time of questions and answers with questions that come from you. Uh, so I always tell my students, never fear the questions that you get on exams, uh, fear the ones that you get from the church. Those are usually the toughest. <clears throat> tell a brief story, a very quick story, and that one of my elders once said, uh, Let's, why don't we have you uh, come into the children's Sunday school in with the first graders and, and let them ask you questions and then you could answer it. And I was like, okay, sure, sounds fine. Easy week of preparation for me. I can just show up. And then uh, <clears throat> I got there to the Sunday school class and I had this six-year-old little girl say, uh, Pastor John, can you tell me, uh, my Bible says um, this passage does not appear in some of the oldest manuscripts. Um, can you tell me what that means? I just thought, oh man, thanks a lot to my elders for suggesting this lovely idea. And so here I had to try to explain textual criticism to a six-year-old. <clears throat> Theological hand grenade. All right. Um, just a brief bit of review here before we proceed. First of all, we've uh, looked at the idea that Adam is the first prophet, priest, and king. He is laboring in a covenantal context <clears throat> within the context of the temple or the garden as the first earthly temple. And that he is given the work to fill the earth with the image of God, to extend uh, the garden order or the temple order throughout the earth, and to exercise dominion throughout the creation. We looked at a number of other uh, appearances of these creation theme elements in the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant. We briefly noted a few of these things as they appeared, for example, with uh, Solomon. And so at this point now, what I want us to do is I want us to focus our attention upon the work of the last Adam, as Paul uh, denotes and calls Jesus. He calls him the last Adam. And that I want us to explore the similarities <clears throat> between the two Adams, the first and the last Adam. I want us to look particularly at the life, death, and resurrection of Christ in these connections. And hopefully we're going to see the connections between what we call uh, Christology, the doctrine of Christ, eschatology, the doctrine of last things, ecclesiology, which is the doctrine of the church, with the doctrine of what we call protology. Okay, Protology, which is the study of first things. If eschatology studies last things, protology studies first things. Um, I wanted to name the book originally, Last Things First, I wanted to name it Protology, but my wife thought it sounded too much like Proctology. <laughs> and I said, thank you, wife, for raining on my scholarly parade. Uh, I was crushed. Uh, and I said, but at the same time, I don't want anybody else to make that connection, so <laughs> we'll have to think of another title. And uh, praise God, through family connections, the idea of last things first came up. In other words, when I say, when we call it last things first, is that we say that the, the, the things that appear at the end, the end of all things, and they pr appear preeminently in Christ, as he is revealed not only in his first advent, but in his second advent, in the consummation of all things at the end of the world, all of those things are anticipated in the beginning uh, with the person and work of Adam. In that <clears throat> we are unable to understand, I think, completely what Christ is doing apart from first understanding what Adam was called to do. This is not to say that we can't understand anything about Jesus if we don't understand what Adam has done. But what we have is we would have a thin account of what Jesus has come to do. Now, what I mean by a thin account, and this is <clears throat> some terminology that one of my colleagues uh, really impressed upon me, and I really like using these descriptions, is that if I only had the book of Romans, if I only had the book of Romans, I, through the book of Romans, would be able to have an understanding of salvation, salvation, 
of my responsibility as a Christian and uh, how I was to live the Christian life and what I was to believe. But apart from the rest of the scriptures and the other 65 books of the Bible, I would have a thin account, quite literally, a thin account of what I needed to believe and how I was to conduct my life, apart from the rest of the Bible. With the rest of the Bible, I would have a thick account. I would know everything that God had revealed to us in the Word. Now, by, uh, by using that thin and thick terminology, we can say that if we don't look at the work of Christ in connection with the work of Adam, we can know something of what he's come to do. We can know a lot about what he's come to do, but in the end, I think it's ultimately a thin account of what Christ came to do if we do so divorced from Adam. And hopefully we'll begin to see this as to how when we make these connections to Adam, uh, then we have a thick account as to what Christ has come to do and how he has accomplished it. So let's begin, first of all, by exploring some of the similarities that we find between the two Adams. First of all, we would say, of course, that Adam is created in the image of God. That is clear from the Genesis narrative. But on the other hand, we also want to say that Christ is the image of God. Notice the difference. One is created in the image of God. The other is the image of God. Uh, Jesus is the uncreated image of God because he is eternally God. Uh, He is fully God. And in that, you know, so in that sense, we want to make that distinction. However, Paul uh, notes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Colossians 1.15, Christ is the image of the invisible God. So here, the scriptures are very clear in identifying Jesus as the image of God. So in this way, Adam and Jesus share this similarity with the difference that Adam is created in the image of God, Jesus is the image of God. Both Jesus and Adam are sons of God, sons of God. Uh, So that we've noted the connections between image-bearing and sonship. God creates Adam in his image. According to Luke 3.38, Adam is his son. Um, Jesus is the image of God, and therefore we know clearly that Jesus is God's son. Both Adam and Jesus share the same threefold office. Adam was the first prophet, priest, and king. The first prophet, priest, and king. He was a prophet in that God gave him the command not to eat from the tree. And at that point in the Genesis narrative, Eve had not yet been created. So Adam's Bible was simple. It was small. And he had one message that he was supposed to preach. (laughs) Don't eat from the tree. Amen. May the Lord bless his reading from his holy and inspired word. Eve, it's so good to meet you. Don't eat from the tree. That's it. Very simple. That was his, the, 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 the whole of his prophetic mission. Don't eat from the tree. Okay? Adam, as the first priest, was supposed to tend and keep the garden. He was supposed to serve God in the temple, and he was supposed to guard its sanctity. So that when that serpent slithered up, he was supposed to kick it out or at least have one of the the cherubim come over and dispatch it. But at the same time, we can also say that Adam was a king because Adam was given dominion along with Eve over the entirety of the creation. You know, you you know, take, uh, be fruitful and multiply, uh, have dominion over the earth, subdue it. So that here, Louis Burkhoff, who was a professor of systematic theology at Calvin Seminary and wrote that, you know, uh, known his, uh, that big uh, systematic theology of his um, uh, back in the 1930s, and it was a standard systematic theology textbook for Reformed seminaries for many years, and it's still a standard text. We use it at the seminary still. 
He says this, quote, the fact that Adam was anointed to a threefold office finds its explanation in the fact that man was originally intended for this threefold office and work. As created by God, he was prophet, priest, and king, and as such was endowed with knowledge and understanding, with righteousness and holiness, and with dominion over the lower creation. So here, this is the similarity that Adam shares with Jesus. Jesus is preeminently our great prophet, priest, and king. God does not, as I've said before, change Adam's vocation, but rather he sends someone who will faithfully execute it. Now, when we get to the life of Christ, those are the similarities, I think, between Adam and Christ. But now let's look at the life, death, and resurrection of Christ so that we can see how his life, death, and resurrection are still uh, inextricably connected to Adam. In that I think it is not insignificant. It's a double negative. That's bad English. It is very significant. There you go. It is very significant that when Luke begins his genealogy, I know we think, I know what you think, because I probably, I've thought it too, and I so maybe there's some of you sanctified saints out there that don't think this, and you're far better than me. And if that's the case, then that's good. But you read those genealogies, and you're like, okay, I don't know how to pronounce all of these names. This looks pretty boring. Maybe I'll skip right over it. So now let's get to the interesting part of the story. Uh, but the genealogies are interesting. There's a lot going on there. Who's named? Who's not named? Uh, but in this particular case, with Luke's genealogy, he starts with Christ and tracing it back. And what people say is, okay, yes, uh, G- uh, Luke is tracing Jesus' genealogy back to Adam. And they think that that's the end of it. Not so, not quite. In that he traces the genealogy back to Adam, who he identifies as God's son, Luke 3.38. And then the next verse begins with the temptation of Christ. Which, if you're thinking about it in terms of the overall structure of Christ's ministry, is that he ends with Adam. And at this point in the narrative, if you've been reading your Bible, you know Adam failed. But yet, here is now Jesus, who is declared my son, in whom I am well pleased. And he is faithful. He is faithful to God's word. And he is obedient in every way. And like I said before, and at this point with the baptism of Jesus, here comes Jesus. He's coming up out of the water. He is one who identifies himself as the son of man. He is the son of God. He is the image of God. And he comes out of the water. The clouds split. The dove descends upon him as he's coming out of the water. And Jesus, God declares, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased and this is the same picture that you see in it with Israel as they come up out of the Red Sea and God places the Holy Spirit in their midst and tends them like an eagle hovering over its young as he pulls them out of the abyss, if you will. And it's the same picture that you see with Noah as Noah gets uh, out of the ark after the spirit, uh, I mean, after the dove has been over the water and the creation emerges out of it. It's the same picture that it crea- uh, appears in the creation with uh, the Holy Spirit superintending the waters as the creation emerges from the waters and Adam and the creation emerge. So that by the time you get to Jesus now, it's quite dramatic. And it's, it, it's dramatic in that God is saying, this is it. This is it. And in particular, again, Gerhardus Voss, he says this, the Old Testament nowhere compares the spirit to a dove. It does represent the spirit as hovering, brooding over the waters of chaos in order to produce life out of the primeval matter. This might be found suggestive of the thought that the work of the Messiah constituted a second creation bound together with the first through this function of the spirit in connection with it. So what Voss is saying here, and I think rightly so, is that Jesus is the beginning of the new creation. Jesus is the beginning of the new creation, the new heavens and earth. At a number of points, in a number of points, Paul makes Adam and Christ connections. He makes 
Um, connections, I think one of the clearest connections that he makes, if you're reading the text carefully, is in Philippians 2, 5 and following. So let's turn over to 2, 5 and following. Let me just briefly read uh, those verses and then uh, we will uh, kind of pick them apart uh, just very briefly. Uh, Philippians 2, 5, it's perhaps a passage that we're all familiar with, but maybe in the light of everything that's gone before now, we'll read it slightly differently. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, <clears throat> who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being, form, uh, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I almost feel like saying we're done. We don't need to read anymore. You know, what else can be said? But first of all, notice here in Philippians 2, 5 and following that Jesus, or Christ, is in the form of God. It's in the form of God. It is the same Greek language that is also used to translate image. So that you could translate it uh, that though he was in the image of God. And here we see the connections. Christ and Adam are both, they bear the image of God. Adam in a created way, Jesus in an uncreated way. Now, here is where Paul discreetly but nevertheless pointedly makes a comparison to Adam. Though he was in the image of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Who tried to grasp equality with God? Adam did. This is where I say that Adam may be thousands of years ago from the vantage point of the text, but in terms of Paul's connection here, he's right there. And in particular, in the context of Paul elaborating about the uh, obedience of Jesus, he's making this uh, profound comparison where he says, unlike the other image bearer, Adam, who tried to grasp, grasp equality with God, this image bearer did not count his equality with God something he already possessed. He did not count it as something to be grasped, but rather took upon himself the form of a servant. He humbled himself and was obedient to the point of death. He would have rather died than be disobedient. Unlike the first Adam, who would have rather died than be obedient. Okay, so here, notice this connection here in terms of, yes, hallelujah, absolutely. Notice this connection here uh, to Adam and his failed work. And this is where I say that a lot of the times in the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, they will assume, the authors will assume that you know what they're talking about because they're assuming the common knowledge of the Old Testament. It would be much like, you know, let me give you this illustration, is that <clears throat> when I used to live in Atlanta, Georgia, there was this thing called the big chicken. Anybody know about the big chicken? I don't see anybody. No? Maybe we can play it a hymn until somebody raises their hand. You know, I'll say, I see that hand. No. Um, the big chicken. The big chicken. The big chicken it was, um, it was this Kentucky Fried Chicken. And this Kentucky Fried Chicken had built into its roof this 50-foot chicken made out of sheet metal. And it had this red head and it had this beak that would, you know, open back and forth and these eyes that would spin around. The big chicken. Well, they went to tear down the big chicken and the surrounding community had a fit. You can't tear down the big chicken. The big chicken is a landmark. It's a landmark here. And so they had to, they remodeled the big chicken. They, you know, painted it again, got the beak and the eyes working and all that stuff. Oh, you're thinking, some of you are thinking, I have no idea where this guy's going with this. <laughs> anyway, 
Um, if I were to tell you, as a fellow Atlantan, go to the big chicken and make a left, you would know what I'm talking about. Because we would have that shared knowledge of where the big chicken is, what road it sits on, and you would know that, you know, everything is related to the big chicken, north of the big chicken, south of the big chicken, west, east of the big chicken. Okay? Maybe there's some place around here that you, everybody knows that, you know, yeah, it's left, east, north, west, whatever. And it's shared knowledge. That's the way Paul and the other writers of the New Testament look at the Old Testament. If you invoke language such as multiply and be fruitful, Old Testament. If you say slavery, Pharaoh, Egypt. If you say, um, you know, Moses, Exodus, Sinai. There are just certain words that just have these automatic connections to it. So that in this particular case, when Paul says equality with God, a thing to be grasped, there's no need to mention Adam's name because he knows that his readers will be familiar with the Old Testament. Let me further illustrate this point in that one of my professors, or I'm sorry, yeah, one of my professors, I'm the dean, so I can call him my professors, uh, is that he's a professor of Old Testament and he was working with one of his, uh, his own professors during his doctoral studies. And uh, he was talking to this professor, and he said, um, well, yeah, I think in Jeremiah such and such, it says this and such and such. And you know, I think it's in Jeremiah 32. And the professor closed his eyes, and he said, um, yes, you're right. And he said, and he looked at him somewhat strangely, and he said, uh, you didn't consult your Bible. He said, do you, do you have the, uh, the book of Jeremiah memorized? That's when it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he says, okay, well then, Wait a minute, how much more do you have memorized? And he says, well, a little bit more. He says, how much more? And he was quiet, he was just shy, and he says, do you have the whole Old Testament memorized? And he says, well, yeah. And so he started to quiz him. <laughs> started, you know, what comes next? You know, just pulling, and he couldn't stump him. He had the whole Old Testament in Hebrew memorized. Um, Ulrich Zwingli, 16th century reformer, had the whole New Testament in Greek memorized. Um, I love computers. <laughs> I love computers. But I often think that technology that's supposed to help us is actually a hindrance to what we're capable of doing when it comes to memorizing the Word of God. So yes, these people probably didn't possess the Word of God in terms of a book in front of their hands, but chances are they probably had huge chunks of it committed to memory. So that when they would hear these things, they would immediately have associations with them. And that they would say, ah, oh, he's referring to Adam. Adam was the one who tried to grasp equality with God. All right, so that's Christ's life. In terms of Christ's death, Certainly we see that Paul compares Adam and Christ, as I said in Romans chapter 5, especially in uh, verse 19. Adam was the covenantal head for all of humanity, and Christ is the covenantal head for all who are in him. Romans 5.12, Therefore as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Or uh, you know, again, correlatively in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Christ is the last Adam. And just as Adam's disobedience is accredited to us and is imputed to us, so Christ's obedience is accredited to us or imputed to us. So that when God looks upon us, and we have faith in Christ alone, we have faith alone in Christ alone, by God's grace alone, uh, God only sees Christ's perfect holiness and righteousness, not anything else. Uh, and so we see those parallels there, except blessedly parallels in the opposite direction. Adam's disobedience brings condemnation, Christ's obedience brings eternal life and justification. In terms of Christ's uh, resurrection, I think that uh, one of the key passages in all of the Bible uh, dealing with the resurrection 
what theologians would call the locus classicus, the classic place that deals with the resurrection, though there are other passages that certainly we would look to, is 1 Corinthians 15. So let's take a look there at 1 Corinthians 15 so that we can take a look at um, the, um, um, the, the, the connections here to the resurrection of Christ and the first Adam or to the creation. First of all, the whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, the whole chapter is grounded in Genesis 1 through 3. If you want to understand this chapter of Scripture, look first and read Genesis 1 through 3. And this is especially evident in verses 20 through 28 and verses 35 through 49. In verses 20 and following, we see these parallels between Adam and Christ. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Okay, so we see this, and there's this uh, connection that goes back to uh, uh, um, Genesis chapter, uh, chapters uh, 1, 2, and 3. And especially you see the connection there to Adam in verses 20 and 21. If you look further down in verse 27, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Now I don't want to say a whole lot about this because that's what we have for tomorrow's sermon. Okay? And I feel like I have to save a little bit of the magic for tomorrow, right? Uh, not that it's magic, it's just a, a colloquialism. Um, but here, he's quoting Psalm 8.6. And Psalm 8.6 is, is originally written to reflect both Adam's original situation in the garden, what is the son of man that you're mindful of him, and you've put all things under his feet, but it's also prophetic of Christ's ministry. We'll look at that in greater detail. But ultimately, Psalm 8, 6 harkens back to the dominion that Adam had over the creation in Genesis 1, and 27. So here, now Paul is applying this verse and this chapter ultimately, because when they quote, when New Testament authors quote Old Testament passages, it's just not the verse that they have in mind, but it's typically the whole section or maybe even the whole chapter, or in some cases, maybe even the theme of a whole entire book of the Old Testament. They're not just cherry-picking words. They're pulling these verses with the whole freight train of information and baggage that comes along with it. And so here, what was once said of Adam is now said of Christ that all things are in subjection to him, all things are under his feet, but it's connected to the resurrection of Christ. Now here's an interesting fact. When was Jesus raised from the dead? Back then. Nobody answered, so I was saying I had to fill it in. But back then, it's something that's already happened. Jesus is now placing all things under his feet, even now. Again, God has not changed the vocation. He has sent someone who will faithfully execute that vocation. Um, and in particular, the resurrection brings forth, along with the life and death and the application of the Holy Spirit through faith, brings forth this new Adamic humanity but this new Adamic humanity bears the image of Jesus, the last Adam. Once again, we also see in verses 35 through 39, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what, do you, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. Now, if we're just reading, we're thinking, okay, yeah, I'm just talking about these different things. But what's the context? What's he reflecting upon? He's reflecting upon Genesis. Adam and Eve made in the image of God. Seeds and plants created on day three. Astral bodies 
stars, if you will, uh, there in verse 41, which were created on day four. Uh, fish and birds. He talks about the skin of fish and birds in verse 39 on day five. The body of man was created on day six. He mentions that in, Genesis, in verse 39. Uh, and then he talks about the Holy Spirit in verse 45. And notice the comparison. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And their spirit should be capitalized. So I give you permission to cross out the lowercase s and write in an uppercase s. In other words, he is the life-giving spirit. And you see this at Pentecost when Christ, and Peter says this explicitly, when he says, when Jesus received the spirit from the Father and poured out this what you now see and hear with your eyes. So that Jesus is the life-giving spirit because he pours out the Spirit of God upon the church to create this new humanity. And interestingly enough, let me see to see if I have this in my notes. No, okay, I don't, so I can bring it in. Something I forgot to put in my notes is that on what day of the week did God begin to create in Genesis 1? First day of the week. What, what is the first day of the week? Sunday. What day of the week does Jesus raise from the, rise from the dead? Just as the new creation, or the first creation, God began that on a Sunday, so too it's as if he puts the old creation to rest on that Sabbath day and begins anew with the resurrection of Jesus on the first day of the week. That's why we gather for worship on Sundays. We no longer gather on the last day of the week waiting for the work to be accomplished so that we can somehow enter into that rest where you work first and then you rest. Rather, we have the privilege of resting first knowing that the work has been completed, that Jesus has come, he has been raised from the dead because he is righteous, and uh, he has begun the new heavens and new earth so that we go about our work in the knowledge that it has been completed already for us, that Jesus has accomplished it. All right? Um, one commentator says this, Christ is the last Adam, prototype of God's new human creation in accord with the original blueprint. On the other hand, he is on the side of God, co-regent with God, co-life giver with the Spirit. And in between, he is God's Son, whose sonship is shared with those who believe in him, the elder brother of a new family, firstborn from the dead. Yet he is also Son of God in power, and he is Lord, uh, whose lordship both completes the intended dominion of Adam and exercises divine prerogatives. So here, I mean, you, you have Jesus finishing the work that Adam was supposed to do. Now, we'll look at that in greater detail, but notice the nature of the work. The original dominion mandate was to spread the image of God, extend the, the garden temple to the ends of the earth, and exercise dominion. Well, who is it that fulfills this dominion mandate? Is it us by ourselves? Is it the broader society or culture? Or is it Christ? And thereby those who are united to Christ, who in Christ fulfill it. And here's where we begin to see some of the connections, as I said earlier, to uh, the Great Commission. In that, remember I said that we had the dominion mandate that extended globally but that once we have it repeated there to Noah, but he fails as well. So then it changes and God promises to make Abraham multiply. He will, you know, he's the one that will do it. But in particular, you have this promise that God gives to Abraham and he says this in Genesis 22:18, and in your seed, all 
the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now, we may not realize this, but the Greek text of the Old Testament, pantata ethna is the, techn- is the language, pantata ethna, all of the nations of the earth, is the exact same phrase that is repeated in the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, pantata ethna, so that what uh, Christ is picking up here when he gives the dominion mandate, as he's picking up that promise back to Abraham that in your seed, who Paul identifies as Christ in Galatians 3, in your seed, all the nations will be blessed. And so now Jesus is saying, go therefore into all the nations and baptize them and teach them everything that I have commanded you. And that all of this is rooted back in God's original command to humanity in Adam that was to extend throughout the earth. And so where we see this work completed is in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. And talking about the saints that are gathered about God's throne. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed a people for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And they shall reign on the earth. Notice that language from Exodus 19.6. Israel is a kingdom of priests. But now that language is not applied to Israel, (coughs) to Israel alone, but now to the church of Christ, one that comes from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And again, too, as I made made this point earlier, as you have in Revelation 21.16, the new Jerusalem, this grand city temple that descends out of the heavens. And according to Revelation 21, 16, the, the city lies four square. It's this huge cube. Does anybody know what other cube appears in the scriptures? The Holy of Holies is a perfect cube. So if you have the Holy of Holies as a cube, and now here comes this grand city temple that is a cube, you know, you read that against the backdrop of the Old Testament, the implied message here is that the city is a huge Holy of Holies. The city lies four square. Its length is the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. Now, Much like Noah, I'm sure, when God said, build the ark by so many cubits, by so many cubits, he probably said, what's a cubit? Um, If you remember that Bill Cosby routine, uh, uh, that probably dates me a little bit. But uh, what is a cubit? Well, a cubit, a cubit, or, you know, uh, is essentially, um, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, 12,000, we're talking about stadia at this point, 12,000 stadia. A stadia is a furlong. What's a furlong? A furlong is essentially 1,400 miles. 12,000 of these are 1,400 miles. I'm horrible at math, does it show? Um, So that 12,000 stadia, if it's 1,400 miles long, 1,400 miles tall, 1,400 miles wide, it was as big as the known world. When Paul uh, said in the end of Romans that he wanted to take the gospel to Spain, he essentially believed he was taking it to the end of the earth. And so, you know, here you have this massive city temple that is the size of the known earth filled with image bearers. What the book of Revelation does is the book of Revelation, uh, you know, in a sense, ends the way that it was supposed to have started. Fill the earth, subdue it, spread my image throughout the earth, And so now here, thousands of years later, the book ends, and it ends the way it started with a city temple that is as big as the earth, filled with image bearers, and the lamb sits upon the throne, and there is nothing unclean within it. This is where I say that you cannot understand 
uh, the work of Christ as fully and as completely as you need to uh, apart from understanding what it is that Adam was first called to do. And this also begins the idea to say that the things that appear at the end, last things, really show up for the first time here in Genesis. Hence the title of the book, Last Things First. And I didn't come up with that title, somebody else did. But interestingly enough, one other point to note is that um, the Bible, again, ends the same way it began. And that in Genesis 3.8, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God, which is a legitimate translation. However, the Greek translation of the Old Testament says they hid themselves from the face of the Lord God. Hid themselves from his face. How does the book of Revelation end? It ends with the saints of God looking upon his face. Revelation 22.4. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Adam and Eve hid themselves from the face of God because they were fearful of his judgment. But because of the faithful work of the last Adam, he who came to complete the failed work of the first Adam, we are now able to behold the face of God at the consummation and the end of all things. And in that way, I think we can see, hopefully, how inextricably bound uh, the work of Christ is to Adam and as to why the Apostle Paul calls Jesus the, the last Adam, the life-giving spirit. But here are some significant differences, and I want to close with these observations, some significant differences, and I want to, you know. First of all, when Jesus redeems us, he saves us by faith alone, in him alone, by God's grace alone. This is very different from Adam. Adam was given work to do. Adam was not asked to believe. Adam was told, work and obey. But as we know, what Paul says to us in Galatians 3.12 is that the law is not of faith. The one who does them shall live by them. In other words, Adam's role was to do, whereas, praise God, ours is to believe and to trust in the one whom God has sent to do that work. You do the law, you believe the gospel. And if you believe the gospel, the Holy Spirit produces that fruit of doing the law. So that's one of the big differences between the two. Second difference, Adam was righteous. God created him upright. At the end of the creation account in Genesis 1, God says, and he looked upon it, and it was good. It was very good. And in the Proverbs, that which is good is that which is righteous. Adam was created righteous and upright without sin. But Adam's righteousness was untested. It was untested, unproven. Moreover, Adam was in a defectible state. He could fall. When Jesus came, he came and he was tempted. And unlike Adam, who is tempted with every single one of his needs being met, dwelling in paradise itself, with not a lack of anything, not a want of anything, not a care or concern. Jesus, as the last Adam, was tempted when he had fasted for 40 days, when he was wandering in the wilderness, and had uh, beasts and creatures around him, potentially threatening him. And Satan comes along to tempt him. And interestingly enough, at the very same points that Israel... God's other faithless son was tempted and failed with eating. 
Interesting how eating features regularly upon this theme. Meals that shouldn't have been eaten or the complaint about a lack of food. And here Jesus comes along and he fasts and and Satan says, why don't you turn these stones into bread? No. I'm not going to put the Lord God to the test. Um, And here he quotes uh, three times from Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 8. The very passages where Israel is noted for where they are supposed to obey God and how they themselves failed. So Jesus comes along and is faithful. And here's the blessing, is that when because Jesus is faithful, he places us in a position that is far greater than Adam's ever was. Because in Adam's state, he's defectible. Our state is indefectible. Our state is indefectible. We cannot fall away. Jesus will not let us go because all whom the Father has given him, he will lose none, he says in John chapter 6. But we will not fall away, not because of our fidelity, not because of our faithfulness, but because of his faithfulness, his fidelity. And then the third and last major difference is that ours is eternity to enjoy and dwell in the presence of God without worry of falling away. Adam was placed there in the garden with the possibility of eternal life. But he didn't secure it because he was disobedient. But Christ has secured it. And unlike every other high priest after the fall, every other high priest entered into the Holy of Holies, did what they were supposed to do, and then left. What did Jesus do? He entered the heavenly Holy of Holies and sat down. He sat down, which means that he now reigns and rules over the heavens and the earth, uh, and he sits in the Holy of Holies Uh, Because he is that perfect high priest who needed no sacrifice of his own in order to cleanse him from sin so that he could enter into the Holy of Holies. And this is why the book of Hebrews constantly contrasts the ministry of Moses with the far superior ministry of Christ. The ministry of the old tabernacle and sacrifices with the far superior ministry of Christ. Those sacrifices of animals and bulls that could not take away sin and the once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus Christ that has cleansed our consciences of all sin and and defilement. So it's important that we recognize the similarities between the first and last Adams, but chiefly the massive dissimilarities. And in those dissimilarities, brothers and sisters, that's where our redemption lies. And so we can rejoice in knowing that the last Adam has been faithful and has secured all of the blessings of heaven for us, that which every other person before failed to do. All right? So on that note, I think we can say amen. Amen.